Hi, and welcome to Voices of the Vietnam Era. My name is Matt Albright, Director of the Center for American Values. I'm here today at the Pueblo City County Library District as part of the All Pueblo Weeds program. This year, we're focused on The Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien in the Vietnam Era. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Colonel Charles Bogle. Each Thursday night at 6 p.m. of October, we'll be bringing you different voices of the Vietnam era, talking about their personal experience during the Vietnam conflict at home and abroad. Colonel Charles Bogle, our guest tonight, flew 841 hours of combat helicopter flying. He is an amazing gentleman and has done many things for our community since he's been here. And tonight, we get to hear about his time during the Vietnam War. Charles? I'm Matt. Hi. How are you doing tonight, <laughs> sir? We're going to keep this a little bit light as we do. I mean, it's a very serious topic, but um, we're going to talk about some serious stuff. But I always like to start. Um, tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up. Uh, originally from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, graduated from high school there, went to Oklahoma State University, uh, went through ROTC there and, uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, after graduation uh, in 1964, uh, had a little period uh, of work before I act reported on active duty in August of 64 and uh, went through infantry uh, basic course and then flight school and then a year in Vietnam. You and I spoke, uh, I know your story a little bit, and I'm really happy to share it with these folks that are watching today and, and we watch them in the future. Um, when you joined ROTC, did you have any expectation of, of being in war at the time? No. Uh, Vietnam was pretty quiet in 1959, uh, at least to, to most of us. And it was a land-grant school. And so by, you know, by choice, whatever, uh, you had to have borrowed TC for a couple of years, and so I just thought I would do that. And then things moved from one thing to another over the period of time. But uh, uh, no, I, I had no idea that I uh, would actually have extended active duty or end up with 30 years of active duty in reserves. Yeah, I, 30 years, that's an amazing career. And um, we'll talk a little bit later in this program about your, your continued uh, passion for our veterans even now. But at the time, uh, how old were you when you graduated? I was uh, 23. So an old guy. Yeah, yeah relative. Well, I, I, I had an engineering degree and with the hours ultimately with advanced ROTC, uh, I took a little longer. I took five years uh, to get my BS. And, and when I went on active duty, uh, at that time, a lot of the aviators were uh, warrant officers. A lot of them uh, had taken an alternative, you know, join the Army uh, rather than go to college and stuff like that. So I was kind of an old man for, for being a second lieutenant. Sure. And then uh, how long, um, what was the process between graduation and did you find yourself in Vietnam or was there a period? Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, uh, I worked the summer after graduation uh, for a utility company in Tulsa and then reported to active duty in August of 64. Um, that went kind of as normal. Uh, came to Fort Walters, Texas to start my uh, flight school. And really that was some of the early buildup as far as the program for Vietnam goes. Um, and our classes uh, at Fort Walters, they started up, upping the class size and such like that. but. Fort Rucker, the second the advanced aviator training, wasn't ready for us. So we spent some time at Fort Rucker between classes. And then uh, I reported uh, Fort Rucker uh, in the latter part of, of 64 and uh, was one of the first to get orders. Uh, but I had orders for Germany. And uh, through the nine months or so of our flight training program, uh, I was one of the last ones to get to my orders revised to, from Germany to, to Vietnam. And then I had a, a period of time uh, at Fort Rucker after getting my wings that was really beneficial to flying with the Department of Tactics and stuff like that, that uh, kind of took some of the school uh, experience off of it and gave some practical flying experience. 
And just to remind our younger viewers, the combat helicopter was a relatively new concept in a way. I mean, 20 years or so at the time. Yeah. Uh, we Luckily, we uh, uh, had the Huey, uh, which really made a difference, turbine powered and stuff like that. And it helped a lot of us get through flight school compared to the old uh, reciprocating engines on the H-19 and, and some of the other aircraft. But uh, we were literally uh, writing the book as far as uh, helicopter use. And, you know, throughout the war, and, and uh, uh, it was, you know, very key to, to the tactics and such in Vietnam. So why helicopters? I mean, there's a lot of different things you, you could have done. I, I, I've met numerous Vietnam veterans, and uh, the helicopter pilots are, are few and far between that I get to speak with. How, how did you get into the helicopter? Well, uh, when I was an undergraduate, they offered flight training at the school. And uh, gosh, at that, and realizing uh, in the 1960s, they said, well, you know, we'll teach you how to fly. You look at your private license. And of course, that was fixed wing. And I thought, gosh, uh, you know, it'd be a long time before I would be able to afford to uh, take private license. So uh, I took, got my pri uh, private license. Uh, they had a good flight school there at Oklahoma State. And uh, so, you know, it was flight school. And they said, oh, well, we're, uh, we're not, not going to be a fixed wing pilot. Uh, you're going to fly helicopters. And uh, it was kind of a... Oh, well, okay, that'd be another adventure. And, uh, uh, and interesting, it was just like the I, I was going to be a graduate engineer, so I applied for the Corps of Engineers. And they said, oh, well, you'll be an infantry lieutenant. And I said, well, no, that was an incentive to get through flight school because I knew what the alternatives were, uh, if, uh, especially with, as Vietnam was, was uh, becoming more active, that... Uh, like I say, it was quite an incentive to get me through flight school. Uh, and of course, my com comrades uh, in infantry thought that we, we had it worse than they did, uh, which was kind of a psychological warfare in that, because uh, we, we all thought we had a better job. So, yeah. Well, and then uh, you told me a little aside uh, previously about how initially uh, you thought you were going Air Force. Yeah. Going back, uh, after I graduated from high school, I went up to Stillwater and, and enrolled and then went on wheat harvest for the summer and uh, came back late in the summer and somebody said, uh, well, you're going to go to college this fall. Uh, what courses are you going to take? And I said, amongst the others, it was, and I looked at, pulled out my enrollment slip and, and uh, this was the space age and I was going to be an engineer and all. And I read the enrollment slip and said military science 111 and I said that doesn't sound like Air Force and so I called Stillwater and they said um, no that's that's Army basic ROTC and I thought well you know two years what difference does it make and uh, and so uh, uh, that's where I got the Army instead of the Air Force um, I had tried to I tested for for the academies uh, and of course, the Air Force Academy was pretty new back in that time frame. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I said, well, I don't, don't want to try that. I tried for West Point. I uh, didn't get a nomination. And, uh, and the, I, my family didn't have a whole lot of military experience. I had an uncle that was a cook in World War II. But other than that, uh, that was about the experience we had. So it was. I guess my 30 years was uh, in the military exposure was a lot of happenstance and maybe sometimes luck and, and sometimes just taking advantage of, of what might came up. It couldn't be called necessarily a, a managed career, uh, but uh, all in all, look backing on it, it was it was rewarding and varied, so I, I have no complaints. Well, in those 30 years, you did so much, but let's take it back to that first moment in country in Vietnam, a young man, uh, 2324 at the time, I think you told me. Um, can you tell us about that first impression of, of getting over there? Well, actually, the, the trick uh, there was another aviator that we met in San Francisco, and uh, a fellow that had a little more experience than I did, 
and it took us uh, several days just to get out of San Francisco because the flight uh, was invariably postponed. And it seemed like every stop we made getting from San Francisco to Saigon, uh, the airplane had something wrong with it. So it took us four or five days. It took quite a ways to, to make that uh, transport. Uh, but the first night we were in, uh, in country, uh, we stayed in Saigon at the headquarters of, of the aviation battalion. And we didn't know it at the time, but uh, there was a major battle going on. And so much of the staff had uh, was gone up forward to, to watch that. And so we were staying in quarters of people that were normally assigned there. And, uh, and of course, first night in country was, was an experience in itself. In the middle of the night, uh, the doors opened and they hear people come back in because they were coming back in and they were getting their, uh, getting ready to go to bed and stuff like that. And of course, we're laying there in bed at half uh, awake, wondering who are these people? And uh, it didn't necessarily make us feel all that good as far as our first night in the country, but we lived through it, obviously. So. Um, and then when did you start seeing that? And I know that uh, generally they started the pilots on slicks or, or troop carriers, but you went right to gunships. We went in, uh, actually the two of us that flew over together, we ended up in the same unit and a uh, little orientation and a test flight. And uh, unexpectedly, uh, after I took my test flight, they said, well, we're gonna send you the Firebirds. That was the gun platoon, and which was kind of unusual. Like you said, generally you got in country experience flying uh, a slick, a troop carrier, and then later transition to the guns. Um, and in fact, the other fellow did go into slicks. Uh, I was real lucky uh, as far as in country and, and learning the slicks is that uh, I was in about the third group uh, that had been in this unit. And we had some experienced uh, pilots in there and I had, I benefited from six to nine months of their experience when I got there. So, uh, yeah, I ended up flying sl or gunships the full, full tour. To, to ask a completely novice, almost childlike question, were you nervous? Were you scared at first? I don't, not, not initially. And generally, uh, the way things would happen uh, when you got nervous was uh, after you got back to the billets at night and then you reflected back on what had happened during the day. And uh, that was probably uh, when, you, when you really thought uh, about what had happened, maybe what didn't happen, such like that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a stimulus, uh, such like that. When you got into action, it, it moved fast and uh, you really didn't have time to think about it for the most part. And you definitely saw a lot of action. As I said before, uh, 841 combat flying hours. Also, the uh, air medal with 31 clusters, meaning essentially 31 air medals. Yeah. A V for Valor and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Um, it's an honor to be with any veteran, but that, that's amazing, sir. And uh, thank you for your heroism and, and what you did. Um, are you comfortable or open to talking about any of those particular actions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've lived with it for 50 years, so it's... <laughs> and but before we go there, something... I, I know you and I spoke about, um, just to do a little aside before we talk about, why do you believe it's important for veterans of your era to talk about their experience? Well, it's healthy. I think, I think uh, one of the things, when I got off active duty, um, I came back from Vietnam, was an instructor at Fort Walter for a while, and uh, I was offered a regular Army commission to stay on active duty, and I chose not to. I did get in the reserves. Um, basically, I had spent five years getting an engineering degree, and, and I wanted to try that. Uh, and I was a little older than, than a lot of my cohorts, uh, and uh, I kind of reflected back that uh, I really wondered, uh, a lot of the classmates I'd had ultimately were uh, killed in Vietnam. And uh, being a little older than some, I was maybe a little more uh, retrospective on my experience. 
and uh, so I, I chose to get off active duty. I, I was offered a regular Army commission, um, and I'm not sure that I really understood the, the ramifications of that, but uh, I did uh, get into the reserves and actually flew for, uh, I guess, nine years in the reserves uh, until I got promoted out of the flying slot. Um, and it was kind of a go back because uh, for many of those years, uh, we had older aircraft in the reserves. And, but uh, in the early 70s, uh, we were the first unit uh, that got QEs in, in the reserves. Uh, and so it was, but it was also a time that uh, a lot of fellows uh, came off active duty, got in reserve units. So there was a situation where at least once a month and, and as we flew and stuff, we, we had, you know, a comfortable situation with fellows that had similar experience. And uh, I think it probably helped a lot of us uh, transition to the non-military, the civilian community, um, and, and kind of protect us in some aspect, because that was trying times. Yeah, it sure was. And uh, just to point out one fact, you said a lot of the gentlemen that you had gone to school with uh, didn't make it home. I believe you told me one third of them didn't make it home. About, and, and most of it, uh, there was few. In fact, I lost a stick mate on the first tour um, that was killed in a, a non-aviation accident. Uh, a number of the fellows that, uh, classmates that stayed on active duty uh, at subsequent tours and uh, were, were killed in, that, in their sec second or third tours. Well, we do this... Uh, one to honor them. I think every time we, we talk of these stories, uh, whether it's your generation of mine, my generation to the next one down, um, this is why we do it, is to mm -hmm. remember those men and women that didn't make it home. And to, to thank you and welcome you home that came home during the tumultuous time. Um, so as we said prior, um, do you mind telling a, a, a quick little story of uh, one of the more harrowing experiences that sticks out in your mind? Well, and we didn't talk about this the other day. I didn't think about it, but I was on one mission that uh, I, we took some fire and uh, uh, well, one of them it severed a hydraulic line on the aircraft and uh, that really restricted the controls and uh, had to come in and, and made a, a powered landing, but it was about without hydraulics, which was something of a test. And then another time, couldn't necessarily attribute it to uh, uh, ground fire, but uh, we had ultimately we fought in an engine, uh, had damage to it, and we lost power slowly. I mean, the, the engine didn't die, but it just less, it had less and less power, and so we couldn't hold the altitude and uh, ended up getting back to our home station in Benoit and uh, getting it on the ground safely. But uh, then it was a matter of seeing if we could move it to a regular parking spot and the aircraft really didn't have enough power to, uh, to move it. So we just let the engine, uh, cut the engine off and had to tow the aircraft to a parking spot. So, you know, there was uh, uh, that. And then uh, typically as a final gunship, we would escort the troop carriers on a, a combat lift as they were coming into an area and uh, we would go in and do suppressive fire as they were coming in and then we would circle and, and circle and uh, uh, in that time frame sometimes uh, if, we, if it was a hot LZ it uh, wasn't unusual we'd call in for heavier support from the Air Force but it might take some time for the Air Force to get there and uh, of course we'd refuel, rearm, and come back and such like that. And you know, it, that varied from, from one mission to the other for that matter. But uh, I was pretty lucky in that uh, uh, I did, never got a Purple Heart, which is one thing I didn't miss. But uh, we did take some, uh, some numerous rounds, but the Huey is very vulnerable as far, or very survivable really. Uh, from small arms fire. So, well, thank you for sharing. One other thing, and uh, 
this is kind of going to everyone out there to show the humility of many of our veterans. When I uh, spoke with Colonel Bogle before this, and uh, he talked about his distinguished flying cross, he said, ah, oh, that was nothing. That was just the one they got written about. So uh, True. it just really shows the humility. Um, I want to move into something that I found very telling. We often hear uh, through movies and media how there was this big disconnect and chain of command in Vietnam but you talk, told me about a different story with the helicopter crews in the time you were there. Well I think probably relating you know there I was as a even as an aircraft commander as a first lieutenant and uh, we'd take a fire team in and we'd get pre-brief if we were going to support the ground, ground troops. troops and you know typically we would go in and, and we're talking with captains and majors or, or maybe higher and here we are as lieutenants uh, and uh, we'd have a lot of responsibility and, and obviously we after a period of time were our experts as far as helicopter gunnery and, and support but we were really respected uh, as peers and, and it was uh, an unusual degree of, of responsibility and uh, think matured a lot of us real fast uh, as it related to, to the mission because um, you know like I say we were dealing with uh, really folks that had been uh, infantry leaders or, or artillery leaders and had a lot of seniority on most of us. Well and you talked about the year you were there how that was really a major change in the war for that year. Yeah. You, I believe you said there was a hundred thousand troops when you got there and by the time you left, there was almost 300,000, is that correct? Yeah, I think it was actually a little over 300. And, you know, we thought uh, we were getting pretty dominant, as, you know, with U.S. forces in South Vietnam. And it, uh, we basically said if, uh, you know, gosh, if we get to half a million troops here, this will be finished. And we'll be able to control the situation. And that was 10 years before the war actually ended. Yeah. So... One thing I'd like to talk about, I know it's a um, difficult topic of the loss. You talk about your passion for veterans and in and, and your time after service. And uh, you told me there's a very special reason where that stems from. Well, um, I lost a younger brother. There were four of us and I'm the oldest. And uh, uh, my, the brother younger than I am, about three years, uh, he, uh, he was a teacher. Uh, went to OCS, uh, uh, actually was commissioned to infantry, and ended up choir director, which was probably the best for him and for the Army. Uh, younger brother uh, followed my path more and uh, went through flight school, and uh, the two of them were on active duty at the same time. He was uh, younger brother aviator, went to Vietnam, and uh, actually extended his tour so that uh, it wouldn't conflict or in such that the other brother might get in uh, orders for, for Vietnam. He had been stationed and had, had a tour in Korea. He extended, uh, was actually flying uh, classified missions and uh, was shot down and killed. Uh, and so that, uh, that was a test for all of us. Uh, had a, a younger brother that was the youngest brother that was in college and uh, it was difficult for all of us, and, and it's taken years to overcome. Would you be gracious enough to talk a little bit about um, your work with veterans now and, and how your passion for the, the war on terror, the, the, the veterans of this more modern war? Well, I guess my once I retired uh, and moved to Colorado, um, the first involvement was uh, kind of more tied to Vietnam. I, was, I got a call on a Sunday night that uh, there was an effort to, to take a Huey uh, from a museum in, in Texas and fly around to the different academies and end up in the Smithsonian. And uh, this friend called me on Sunday night and said, there's going to be a meeting in Colorado Springs. Um, you ought to be up there. And uh, I said, okay, and it was no warrant officer for anybody. And so sure enough, uh, I went to the Springs and uh, we had a meeting and I met uh, a fellow that had previously moved to Colorado 
that was in the springs that I saw there. And so we were connected and we ended up basically coordinating the agenda of uh, Huey's 091 uh, here in Colorado for, uh, for about a week. And uh, I had the privilege of landing it on Main Street uh, near the convention center here in Pueblo uh, while it was on display. And uh, we had speeches in front of the Medal of Honor uh, display and stuff like that. Uh, and I was involved in that through the delivery of the aircraft in, in Washington to the Smithsonian. And then that organization transitioned into supporting uh, some of our, this was uh, in the early 70s, uh, we were providing uh, uh, mobility devices that I bought to handicapped veterans. And so uh, got involved in interviewing and, and getting to know a lot of physically handicapped veterans from the early part of the uh, post 9-11 war and uh, we provided uh, this uh, the iBots to those uh, and that got me a, a lot of experience in the, in the younger veterans and uh, and actually uh, with some of the contacts I'd cultivated here in Colorado uh, I got involved with the retiree council at Fort Carson and have been on it gosh ever since in fact I'm, I'm chairman of the retiree council at Fort Carson now but uh, had an opportunity while we were looking for handicapped veterans, I, I went to uh, one of the uh, campaigns that the Coalition of Slew America Sealers had in Orlando and went down there with the intent of, of uh, interviewing and for possible candidates for IBOC recipients that we were donating and uh, got familiar with their program and some of their initiatives and uh, we're, we're impressed. Uh, it was an event where uh, they brought families and veterans down there and had all kinds of uh, support for them and, and everything. But then several years later, uh, actually about seven years ago, uh, some of our efforts here uh, uh, were kind of accumulating and I was talking to an old friend that had been with the coalition for some time and I said, you know, there's we got a lot of things going here. And he said, well, we have a new president uh, of the coalition. Why don't you work up an agenda for two or three days and we'll try to get him to come out because he's probably never been to Colorado and, and uh, be interesting on what uh, what you're doing out there. So in turn, uh, uh, I organized that. We spent three days from Denver to, to Pueblo visiting different venues, uh, different veteran sports and stuff like that. And they were just starting what they call an ambassador program then. And I knew a fellow that, that uh, I'd known from previous exercise that was in Texas, that was the first of their ambassadors. And it's just spokesmen and promoters for the effort. Well, before the president of the coalition left, uh, I was the second ambassador. And uh, uh, because I thought the program really had value and, and I just, the the uh, president and I just hit it off. We liked it. Well, I was several years uh, as an ambassador, and then he said, well, would you come on our board of directors? And I said, okay. And I'm the, the westernmost uh, member of the board of directors. The headquarters for the coalition is, is uh, in Virginia. And the new president of the board, by the way. Uh, as of a week ago, as of a I'm week assuming ago. the presidency of the board of directors, yes. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing effort you have there. And you can learn more about the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes. You can look it up online. It's a, it's a great organization. Uh, I want to finish with this. Uh, whether it be a veteran from the modern era or a veteran from the Vietnam conflict or, or, or anywhere in between or, or prior, what is one message you would like to take this opportunity to, to say to your fellow veterans? I think, I think it's healthy uh, for us to, to cope with what we've experienced with, to, to be associated with other veterans. Um, we've got a chapter of Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association here in Colorado that, you know, it's a bunch of old men now, but we still can uh, coordinate and, and commiserate with each other. Uh, it may not be so easy for for us to talk across the generations, but I would encourage 
that we've all got something to share and it's good ventilation. It's good good way to get support that sometimes we don't get in the civilian community, but uh, it certainly helps fill a gap in, in a lot of our lives. And I would encourage whether it's, uh, you know, through the American Legion, BFW or whatever else, to try to find a group that uh, uh, that you're comfortable with and that you can socialize and and, uh, and be supportive of each other on. I think it's it's healthy for all of us. I think that's great advice. Well, once again, thank you so much, sir, um, right. for your time and, and coming coming down here. A um, uh, little bit of a drive. Lives in Custer County, but uh, <laughs> definitely <laughs> passionate about our public community. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh, watching this first installment of Voices of the Vietnam Era. Again, stay tuned and, and keep watching these videos every Thursday night, 6 p.m., or, or check them out online and follow up on the All Pueblo Reads program, uh, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carry. Thank you.